Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with your latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the world. In this edition, Chris Kelly, the chief executive of Landcorp, the country's biggest farmer, returns a big fat dividend to the government of $27.5 million. But should the state be in farming? The economic cost of the crippled RENA and the cleanup. Taxpayers could be liable for millions of dollars. Will local businesses get the same kind of government bailout dished out for the Christchurch earthquake? And the woman who fronted Natural Dairy's failed Chinese bid for the Crayfar farming empire is charged over the alleged payment of secret commissions and money laundering in New Zealand. More on that soon. But let's start with a look at the world markets. Joining me now is ASB World Economist James Shortle. And those markets, James, are much more positive this week. Well, a bit more positive than what they have been. Uh, last week we saw, saw a reasonable increase, uh, first increase in, in a while, uh, particularly out of the US market. So, um, you know, things are uh, looking slightly better, but there's so much going on that, uh, you know, tomorrow if we're talking, then, they, then we could see some downward streaks. Now, a lot of it depends, of course, on what's going on in Europe. Some big meetings coming up. Where are we at? Well, we're still in limbo, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of talking going on, and uh, there's a lot more, a lot more discussion around the fact that uh, there's a bit more confidence that we could see some decisions made. But you know, reading some of the things overnight, and uh, you know, we've got uh, Angela Merkel uh, from Germany. She's really saying things are only going to progress very, very slowly. This yeah, taken... th this is a surprise to the market because everybody thought it was going to be solved at the next big meeting uh, on Thursday. Well, that's right. But she's saying, look, this has taken decades to, to happen. It's not, it's, we're not going to change in one meeting. Uh, so it's going to be sort of millimeter by millimeter, I think. And, and they might, they're, they're going to announce some, some further discussions and some potential measures, but there's not, nothing's going to be in concrete, let's be honest. How's it affecting the New Zealand dollar now? Uh, we are strengthening. Well, New Zealand dollar, of course, dropped. So uh, I guess the biggest effect that we've seen over the past few weeks is that we've dropped with the uh, negative sentiment around the whole the whole marketplace. So we dropped down to you know that 76 mark, but uh, since then we're back up to 80. Yeah, we're back we're back up. We were trading above 80 cents for for a period there. Um, as we sort of speak, then we're probably around that 79.50 mark. So there's been a bit of a mixed uh, mixed reaction over the past couple of days. Now two big shocks coming in the local market from Fletcher Building of all companies and also Cavalier Carpets. Uh, they're not doing very well. Yeah, well, it's interesting because uh, the local market here has actually performed really well compared to what we've been seeing overseas. And, uh, you know, we talked about this last week, actually, around uh, the New Zealand, NZX. Um, has, has, has been on a downward street, but nowhere near what other, other markets have been doing. And that's because some of our companies have been doing really well. But last week we saw Picture Building, which was the number one company on the local market. They announced that, uh, you know, they're, they're a bit more pessimistic about their outlook for the current year. Um, New Zealand Australian Constructions not looking so sharp and actually looking further ahead, they've been really been relying on the, the crisis rebuild and that's just not going to happen. It, yeah, exactly. Nobody knows when exactly it is going to happen. So that's got to have a chilling effect on a lot of other companies here. Well, they, they, uh, definitely. And uh, so, they've, so they've said, you know, profits aren't going to be anywhere near as good as what, they, uh, as what they were expecting. And that saw their share price tumble by around 12.5% yeah. in one day. It's just huge. They fell from number one to number two. Um, and then you also look at Cavalier, and the similar, you know, when you talk about construction, their, their outlook is, is all about putting new carpet on new floors. Um, and I've said the first three months of their financial year, um, some of their sales are down 20%. So, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty major. And this came as a real shock to the market. Now, sheep and uh, cattle prices are doing very well. Yeah, they've, they've, been, uh, they've been really strong. and uh, Defying the odds. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess... Some of the established markets, for, particularly for sheep meat, um, you know, they're probably not looking quite as sharp economically, but demand's still holding up. And uh, you know, it's interesting that, like dairy, um, sheep has also been benefiting out of uh, some of the developing economies out of China. A lot of uh, product is, is heading to China. It's now uh, virtually our number two export market in sheep meat. So um, you know, China is really driving a lot of things here in New Zealand, agriculturally, um, as well as all the markets. In terms of beef prices, uh, U.S. Uh, prices up again? U U.S. prices looking pretty strong. They lifted over the past week. Um, it's interesting that uh, the U.S. market is actually now a net exporter of beef as opposed to a, a net importer, which is a bit of a change in scene for them. Um, so that's actually offered us uh, a bit more of an opportunity to supply product into that market, and uh, prices are still pretty strong. Okay, let's talk grains. 
Yeah, well, it's interesting. Last week, the U.S. Department of Agriculture they announced their latest. Every every once in a while, they provide forecasts of where demand and supply is going for a lot of the agricultural uh, sectors. And last week, they uh, released their latest stats on uh, on crops, and it's it's looking like. The crop conditions have improved a bit out of the US um, with a slightly weaker economy around the world. Demand's not going to be quite as strong, so they're actually picking it's going to be more supply of product available, and that was uh, pretty bearish or pretty negative for prices, uh, which we've actually seen prices fall back over the past week. And the latest global dairy trade auctions are out, and uh, apparently we should be celebrating a little bit. Definitely celebrating. First time in four months we've seen a price rise, um, not a huge price rise, 1.7% on a trade weighted basis, but Good news considering that we've seen production expanding rapidly in this part of the world, other parts of the globe as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, an increase is a great thing and gives us a bit more comfort around the payout. Thank you, James. Coming up after the break, an international mining giant wants out. It's selling up. What will become of one of New Zealand's largest export businesses way down south? Anti corporate nanny bank protests spread around the world. Riots by 100,000 angry citizens in Rome caused more than a million dollars in damages. And cashing in on the boys in black. Kiwis and visitors are spending up large as the competition heats up. The Rugby World Cup, economic boom or bust? But first, according to a Christchurch survey that tracks the South Island's economy's health every three months or so, Canterbury's economy is on the mend after the big quake. It's found that the first quarter's lower business activity has been reversed in the June quarter. So ponder this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What percentage is Canterbury's economy growing in the June quarter compared to March? The answer when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what percentage is Canterbury's economy growing in the June quarter compared to March? Canterbury's economy is on the mend, up 1.9% in the June quarter after shrinking 2.8% in the March quarter. Joining us now is Murray Weatherston, former BNZ chief economist and current director of Financial Focus. Murray, welcome, and let's start with the All Blacks. Uh, you've been to some of the games. It's got to be good for the ca good for the cash registers. Well, yes and no. I, I mean, I don't think it's the economic nirvana that some people would have made it out to be. It's certainly, it's certainly good for the economy, but um, I mean, there's some figures out this morning that says you know, the governments in the rugby union are, are, are losing $40 million on the operational side of it. The local authorities have put in a couple of hundred million dollars, uh, and that's before you take in the stadium enhancements or not. There's actually been a lot of money spent on it. Sure, it's been a great event. You know, it's been run extremely well. There's been, apart from some refereeing decisions, there's been no... <laughs> we no, won't no, go into that. Th there's <laughs> been no, you know, major con controversies. We're up to the last minute and, you know, perfection would be if the All Blacks beat France on Saturday, on Sunday, rather. I think most economists have agreed that, uh, James, uh, uh, while there has been, uh, you know, quite a bit of spending by the foreign visitors, it hasn't been, as you said, the nirvana that we expected. Should we be disappointed or do we have to be realists about this? Oh, I think probably um, re realistic. There's been, I mean, all the areas that haven't had games have probably suffered a little bit. I've heard about, you know, Queenstown and that sort of thing. There's been fewer tourists heading to those sorts of areas. Uh, I'm actually heading, to, uh, heading down to Queenstown this coming weekend uh, to visit my sister, and there was no trouble getting flights. I mean, everybody wants to be, you know, in, in Auckland, I guess, sort of to be close to the game, party central. So, you know, some of those other areas, people just haven't have, have locked up shop and decided, well, I'm not going to go on holiday, or I'm not going to do those sorts of things. So, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's trade-offs, I suppose. Hey, I was intrigued to read that if the All Blacks win, they each get, what, $100,000? But if the French had won, they would have gotten $310,000. Uh, this says a lot about the uh, New Zealand economy, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, we are much smaller. The thing, the thing that probably hurts more is if the French lose, they get two hundred and forty thousand dollars. So it's a bit like a tennis tournament where you, the money you make depends on how you did last week. Yeah. Yeah. You can't and, go. And wrong. the All Blacks are all or nothing, and the French, as I say, the French apparently already got a bonus of. $240,000. Okay, speaking of the French, over in Europe now, all eyes in the world are on Europe. I see that the German Chancellor, uh, Ms. Merkel, was uh, hammering the U.S. saying, listen, uh, it's not just us that are creating the big crisis in the world. Uh, the U.S. has a lot to answer for, too. Do you buy that? Well, I, I think the Europeans have got more immediate problems because they've got some countries that are about to default. Um, the Americans had their problems with their 
government debt ceiling earlier in the year. But that wasn't because they were going to default. You know, they had always had the money to pay the bills. Uh, that was about it. They were coming up against a self-imposed limit. Um, Greece is clearly going to default in some fashion or not. And all, a lot of the argument is about um, how, does, how do they stop that being too severe and too contagious. Yeah, but you know, was the rest of Europe just too ambitious to begin with? Everybody knew that Greek was going to struggle to repay, you know, the debt at the level that they set. Uh, we're just wasting time, aren't we, James? Well, I think it comes back to there's there's a lot of finger pointing in for for a very good reason, in my opinion, because. Um, what people don't, don't everyone's under, sort of always thought, well, if you loan money to a government, they'll just raise taxes and they'll sort, they'll sort things out. There's going to be no issues. But what people haven't quite uh, realised is that governments don't actually aren't able to make decisions, and because of political reasons, then they aren't able to get decisions through to change things rapidly. Uh, they've also got political pressures from the voters, all those sorts of issues. So the fact that the US weren't able to make decisions quickly. That's now calls into question every other country that is looking to to, uh, to borrow money. So the same thing happening with Greece. I've committed to, um, you know, to to making these uh, deficit cuts, um, but they haven't because they just can't, you know, aren't able to make those changes. So it calls into question all governments and all decision makers. Yeah, and, and meantime we're seeing this growing wave around the world. Started in Canada, by the way. I want you to know, uh, protesting Wall Street, if you like, uh, Occupy Wall Street, they call it. But now it's 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 in in eighty two different countries. In Rome, we saw devastation, lots of riots, uh, people injured, a million dollars in damages. Uh, can we expect to see more of this? Oh yes, I, I actually think it's the outcome of you know four or five years of no economic growth. Um, you know, when the pie is growing, then if 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 my income doesn't rise, it it doesn't have to fall. All right. But when, when the pie is shrinking, somebody has to get less than what they got before. And I think, you know, right throughout history, whenever people have had things taken away from them, if, and especially if it goes on for a reasonably long period of time, they tend to get a bit angry about it. Do you know the surprising thing about it, though, Murray? Uh, in Germany, 4,000 people are protesting. Germany's doing great. The economy's wonderful. What does that tell us? Well, I guess they don't agree with what's happening and the fact that they are also having to, um, going to have to bail out some of these countries that have made um, poor decisions or um, have been living it up for a couple of decades. So, you know, they're angry about it. They've got every reason to be and uh, they're showing it in their own way. Now, we had thousands of people here in New Zealand, of course, over the weekend protesting. We were very nice and polite. Uh, is there any point? Do we really have a beef? What do you think? Well, you know, lots of people um, have been disadvantaged over the last few years. You know, incomes, not everybody's income has gone up. A lot of people's incomes have gone down. And we just tend to get dissatisfied if we think other people are doing better than we are. It just seems like it's been a year of such bad news for New Zealand. Now we have uh, the shipwrecked arena. That's going to cost us potentially a lot of money. Um, uh, who should pay for that, James? Well, I mean, I guess, <laughs> I don't know who should pay for it, but it has to be paid from somewhere, right? I mean, uh, well, should, should the taxpayers be paying for it, do you think? Well, who well, else is going to pay it? Yeah, I mean, I guess we've got insurers that potentially could, but, um, you know, it has to be done now. I guess they can argue about the uh, the insurers later on, um, whether or not that's, that's going to cover it all. I'm not sure, but... Um, you know, we have to we have to get on with the job and because it's it's ruining the environment. Let's take a look at the cleanup costs so far, and here's what I've been able to figure out. The ship's owners will stump up to twelve point one million dollars. Funds from the oil pollution levy, that's another four million dollars. Fines for gross negligence for an individual up to three hundred thousand dollars. For a company up to six hundred thousand dollars. Contributions from MSC, the Mediterranean Shipping Company, which claims no legal liability. There, after we've squeezed them, John Key squeezed them by the neck. They're going to give a million bucks, maybe, um, leaving the rest to come from taxpayers. Although the salvage bill is going to be the ship owner's responsibility. The real cost is much actually much higher than that. Um, if they'd had to pay for all the volunteer labour that they've had cleaning up the oil, um, we don't know what the cost to businesses in you know, the surrounding area is actually going to be. I mean, the surf schools are, are shut, the fishermen can't get out, um, tourists might not come. The, 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 the real cost will actually be far, far greater. It will be, and here's the question. Do you think the government, us, should be stumping up to help out uh, the local business community? Uh, the fishermen, for example, that can't get out, uh, the people that will not show up, the tourists, uh, this summer, because they think the beaches are, are still filled with oil. What do you reckon, James? Does well, the government have a responsibility, like the Christchurch quake? 
Uh, I think it's a little bit, it's, it's going to be slightly different. I mean, the government, of course, they want to underpin things to make sure that the economy's still going, that people, are, 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 you know, are still happy. But, you know, the buck's got to stop somewhere. Um, there's got to be some form of insurances or um, income loss insurance around some of these things. I mean, uh, whether it's an oil spill or some other devastation, then, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, we've got, to, we've got to limit some of these things at, at some point. So I, I'm not sure that the government has to stump up with a whole lot here. They've got a role to play, but um, it's got to be limited in some way. I think James is absolutely correct. We just have to pay the cost of whatever it is to clean up the environment. Um, and the, the last person standing to pay is always going to be the taxpayer. OK, let's go way down south now, gentlemen. Uh, we heard this week that Rio Tinto is going to sell off the aluminium smelter uh, down there. It's been there for 40 years, employs up to 2,000 people, 900 full-time. That's got to be a bit of a blow, don't you think? No, I don't think so at all. What, what's actually happened is Rio Tinto has decided that in this part of the world they don't want to run aluminium smelters and, anymore. And in many other parts of the world as well. They're divesting all over the That's place. Right. But their package, they're, they're not actually saying we're closing the smelter. They own 79% of it. They're packaging that with some bauxite and alumina plants and whatnot. And they're going to set that up as a separate subsidiary. And their intention is to flog that off either in a trade sale to, you know, as a separate business or maybe it's a share market float somewhere down the track. But they're actually not in a hurry to do it. And, and I think it's... You know, we shouldn't be alarmed about the fact that Rio Tinto, as an owner, has decided they don't want to be in that business anymore. They're not closing the aluminium smelter. No, but they've got to find somebody that's going to come in and buy it. And let's face it, China's chasing uh, that kind of business very hard right now. That might be one of the very reasons they got out. Yeah, well, you know, aluminium plants tend to follow cheap electricity. Um, and, you know, you, you start off with bauxite, you turn it into alumina, and then you turn the alumina with lots of electricity into aluminium. You know, that plant's been there for 40 years, so long as the uh, uh, bauxite's still there, it's got to be smelted somewhere. OK, let's talk about the Crayfar Farms. Of course, one of the early bidders, uh, and they chased it hard, uh, the Chinese through Mei Wang, who we now hear is being done in Hong Kong on criminal charges of laundering money, uh, corruption. Um, your reaction? Well, pretty sh shocking, to be honest, that we've had someone, you know, doing business here in New Zealand, um, you know, with these sort of charges against them, uh, and obviously also uh, playing a big part in, in, in some of our, our large farming assets. So, you know, pretty shocking to hear those sorts of news, that, that sort of news, and, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see where it comes from. It's obviously not confirmed or anything yet, um, so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it folds out. Well, so was it a good move for the Overseas Investment Office to turn her down? Because uh, one of the things they didn't like about, uh, about the company that she was fronting was was uh, its questionable character. Does this prove them right in the long run? Um, I guess they would be yeah, glowing with the fact that she's been charged with these, these offences. I guess we should say that she hasn't been found guilty yet. Um, Absolutely, the trial is yet to come. Th that's right, but, but clearly there was some, um, you might say, smell around about the bids at the time, and you know, we, I think we have to be thankful that they didn't end up buying them. So maybe the OIO isn't such a, su such a bad thing after all. In this case. In this case, yeah. Let's talk about Landcorp, James. Uh, this is the country's biggest farmer, and it has just uh, uh, had a record dividend. Well, not a record, but it's had a very healthy dividend paid back to the government. Question is, should it be in the farming business? Well, I think it's you know it's good for you know to have a, a large corporate farmer in New Zealand. I mean, they are a massive corporate farmer. <laughs> um, so I guess the question marks around the size of them and um, you know whether whether they're impinging on the on the other the rest of the, the farming community. But um, in my opinion, the Land Corp do uh, some some fantastic things. They are sort of at the forefront of some of the farming initiatives that they are involved in around sustainability, uh, new technologies, um, breeding, and that sort of thing. So uh, as long as the rest of the farming community in New Zealand can leverage off the learnings that they've got, then I think it's um, you know it is, it is good space to be in. Yeah, but aren't they competing with farmers? I mean, let's face it, uh, the government's privatized a whole lot of other industries. Uh, why is it in farming? Couldn't the private, couldn't the private sector do a better job, Murray? Well, maybe it's in farming because it's historically been in farming, and it's a, it's an historical accident. Um, I don't, th I'm not aware. James will be able to put me right, but I'm not aware of any moves to, you know, privatise. Landcorp. No, in fact, the Agriculture Minister, David Carter, says if, if his government goes back in, he's got no intention of doing that. That's right. So He's quite may happy. Maybe they've got a double standard for electricity assets versus farmland. There seems to be something about you know, ownership of land that you know, triggers national and state ownership. 
I mean, the land corps in a, in, a, in a market situation, so are they competing with farmers? All farmers are sending their product, you know, overseas um, in a lot of cases. So, uh, you know, in terms of the probably only ways they might be competing is on, in, is on land, and um, the market dictates the land. If a farmer wants to buy it, they pay more. Well said. Thank you, James. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world. Hold on tight as our experts take us along for the ride and point out what they'll be watching over the coming week. But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. Which two countries are the world's fastest producers of millionaires? James wants to go there. Find out after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you which two countries are the world's fastest producers of millionaires? Singapore and India. But the reality for most Indians is still abject poverty. 77% of India's population survives on just 51 cents a day. Murray, could you do that? No. I don't think so. No. Meantime, you've been jetting off to Iceland and all kinds of exotic parts of the world. Uh, tell me about your trip there and, and, and sort of your impressions of the economy and how people are doing in that part of the world. Well, I don't think they're actually doing very well in that part of the world. Uh, they were a um, like a bellwether economy before the global financial crisis. Uh, their banking system grew to be something like six times the size of their economy. Uh, people thought they were very prosperous and all the rest of it, and then the wheels fell off, and now they're actually a relatively poor country. Um, their exchange rate has crashed, so it made it you know, pretty, a lot cheaper for us you know, travelling through there. Um, they're about as far away from New Zealand as you can get. For the ge geography people, they're something like 20 degrees west of Greenwich, and they're about 64 degrees north of the equator. So that you know, they're, they're and they're miles away from everything else. They're an island nation, um, only 300,000 people, so it's actually you know quite a small place, but very beautiful. You know, t tourism's clearly a, a you know huge industry there. Their problem is the same one though, I guess that New Zealand's got is that they're so far away from other people. And Murray, we've been looking at some beautiful photos that you took while you were there. Uh, they rely on fishing and uh, farming. Of course, That's they right. had uh, all the ash outflow from uh, the volcano not so very long ago. How are they doing today? Well, the, 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 they're used to volcanic eruptions. They've had seven in the last 15 years. They get over it. The, the nature you know, sort of cleans it away. Um, but their geothermal activity is actually quite strong. You know, they've, they've got a lot of... Um, geothermal electric plants, they pipe hot water into Reykjavik, uh, they've got very cheap electricity, uh, they heat their glass houses with geothermal power, and the surprise, one of the surprising things I found out, 14% of the economy or GDP is accounted for by aluminium smelters. Wow, there so you got, go. So they've got three aluminium smelters now, there's another one being built and another couple being planned, but again, that just shows that, what I talked about before, that um, aluminium smelters chase abundant and cheap electricity. Gee, do you think they'd want to come here to New Zealand? Or is our electricity just too expensive? Well, our, our, our electricity now is too expensive. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're not going to be they're not gonna, they're, put they're, up their hand. They're not going to be putting up their hand. No. But a very beautiful country. Um, about you know, a lot of the same things as New Zealand, the geysers, the waterfalls. Um, I think Rotorua is far more attractive in terms of boiling mud and, and silica and you know, things like that. But a uh, fascinating place to be. I've been once, so I'll probably never go again, but I'd encourage other people to do so. Great, thank you. And and you, of course, have been in Fiji on a holiday, but how's Fiji doing? Oh, well, it's sunny. That's, that's <laughs> all I care about. <laughs> so you, get, you just switch off that economist right. brain, don't care. If it's uh, $12 for my time, I'm getting it. The blinkers were on. The yeah. blinkers were on. I was enjoying the sun. No, I mean, uh, Fiji uh, still seems to be going, um, you know, the same same old, um, you know, Fiji time. So um, there were plenty of Australians and Kiwis over there. Um, and I have to say that I enjoyed uh, watching watching the game on uh, Sunday night and, <laughs> and living it up while the Australians were, uh, were wallowing. Fantastic. So go the All Blacks. Uh, where are you going to be uh, for the big game? I'm going to be down in Wanaka visiting uh, my sister, actually. So uh, looking forward to it. I'm on the knife's edge like everybody else, I think. Fantastic. And James, uh, let's ask Murray, where are you going to be for the big final? I'm going to be sitting, sitting in the West Stand at the ground. Oh, what do you have to pay for your ticket? Come on, tell us. $750. Ooh, is it worth it? 
I haven't seen the game yet. Okay. <laughs> if we win, sure it will be. If we lose, not so sure. Okay, we will uh, have you back on the show to find out uh, how we fare. We'll know shortly. Thanks to my guests, Director of Financial Focus, Murray Weatherston, and ASB Rural Economist, James Shortle. Be sure to check out our website. Meantime, no pressure, but let's hope the boys in black pull it off and show the world what we're truly made of. May they be focused, fabulous, and functioning with a firm grip on the ball at all times. Not like these guys. Keep the faith. See you next time.